Hello and welcome back to Reading Through Mark. We're again getting to know Jesus as we read through uh, this one gospel and talk about the various things and ideas that come up. Uh, we are in the middle of Mark chapter 9. We just last time read about uh, the transfiguration. Again, there should be a uh, link to the playlist, the full playlist uh, down in the description. Um, so we're in Mark chapter 9, halfway through, starting at verse 14. Uh, so Jesus and three of his disciples, uh, Peter, James, and John, uh, are just returning to the rest of the disciples after this uh, mountaintop experience of the transfiguration. And now this is what happens when they catch up with the rest of the disciples. Uh, so Mark chapter 9, verse 14, there it says, When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet He stood, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because uh, he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant, and they and they were and were afraid to ask him about it. This is God's word. All right, so quite a lot going on here. So like I said, uh, Jesus had just been up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus uh, let his divinity shine through. He spoke with Moses and Elijah. God the Father spoke from heaven. Then they came down from that mountain. They come back with the rest of the disciples, and it appears that there's this argument that has uh, been going on between the disciples and the scribes, uh, and it sounds like what happened was this guy brought his demon-possessed child to the disciples to be healed. The disciples couldn't heal it, though. Jesus had given them, pre uh, Jesus had previously given them the ability to cast out demons, but for whatever reason, they were not able to at this point. Um, and so the scribes, the leaders, the religious leaders likely were grabbing onto this opportunity to say, aha, Jesus is not legitimate because his disciples can't actually cast out this demon. So that is likely the argument that is going on here. Um, and so, uh, some interesting things here. Um, first off, um, why couldn't they cast out the demon? Uh, the disciples, again, they ask Jesus what happened there. Uh, and Jesus' answer is, this one can only come out with prayer. Um, there's an a alternate um, manuscript that says this one can only come out with prayer and fasting. Um, and that's, that's kind of interesting for us to think through, right? Uh, what are you doing uh, when you are praying? Nothing, right? You're, you're waiting on God to act when you're praying. Okay, you're, you're trusting in him to act. You're asking him to do something and trusting in him rather than you getting up and accomplishing something. Or uh, when you're fasting, right, what are you doing? You're actually withholding from yourself the energy that would make you get something done, right? Uh, and so Jesus' answer here that only prayer and fasting can make these uh, demons come out is Jesus pointing his disciples to the reality that they can't. They never could cast out demons. It's, it seems that likely what's going on here is that the disciples were, again, Jesus had given them the power previously to cast out demons, but it seems here they were starting to get a big head. They were starting to say, look at how powerful I am. Look at my ability uh, to cast these demons out. And so here they were smacking into the reality that, no, they can't do these things. They need God to do these things uh, working through them. Uh, and so that, that's likely what is going on here. Um, <clears throat> 
Next uh, interesting point in here uh, is uh, this this father, okay, the father of the demon possessed child. Um, he asks Jesus, yeah, if you can do anything, and Jesus kind of takes uh, takes uh, umbrage at that. He's like, what? If I can, right? Uh, any anything is possible for him who believes. And the guy has this fascinating response: "I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief." And this is something for us to really wrap our heads around, especially if you've been a Christian your whole life. Uh, we all have to recognize that we believe, and yet we also don't believe. Uh, in in theological terms, we uh, say that a, a a sinner or a Christian is simultaneously a saint and a sinner. Uh, and so in, in the same way, we can also say we are simultaneously believers and unbelievers, right? Uh, the believer, the saint, right? That is the new creation that God has made us to be. But we still have this old flesh, this old Adam. We are still in many ways a sinner. We are still in many ways an unbeliever, right? Uh, and so our old flesh, the natural human way of living, never is going to believe anything that God says, never is going to trust in God for anything, never is going to uh, uh, live according to what God says. But it is the new creation in us. It is the saint. It is the, um, the, the, the new life of the spirit that leads us to believe what God says, to trust in his word, trust in his power, right? Uh, and so um, this is, again, one of those places for us as Christians that uh, we all have this growth that we need to go through. We want to, as Christians, recognize where are those parts of my life where I don't fully believe God? Right? Uh, so maybe I, I believe God in my head, you know, I can tell myself that. Uh, but when it comes to being generous with my money, like God tells me, uh, well, I don't quite trust God to do that. Right? Uh, or maybe uh, I, I don't quite want to live uh, my marriage uh, the way that God, or, or just sex in general. Maybe I don't want to uh, treat sex the way that God wants me to. And so I, I, I don't believe God uh, with regard to what he says in that regard. Right? Uh, whatever it is. Right? Um, we have these various aspects of our lives, right? And as Christians, we want to grow to trust God with every part of who we are and not just uh, one aspect here and there. Uh, so yeah, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. That's a good prayer for us all to know. Let's uh, continue on here. I think we can keep going. Um, so we're in Mark chapter 9. We're at verse uh, 33. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked, what, are you, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but the one who sent me. So we just saw the disciples learning a little bit about humility when they were not able to cast out this demon. Now here, again, they're still full of pride. They still want it all to be about them and how important, how cool they are. Uh, and so here uh, they are arguing about which of them is the best. Uh, and Jesus says that's not how Christianity works, right? Uh, within Christianity, uh, we set ourselves as the lowest. We set ourselves at the bottom rung uh, and we want to raise God up. Uh, as John the Baptist said previously, we must become less. Jesus must become greater, right? Uh, and so Jesus then goes and so he takes this little children, a little child, right? Um, and even today, right, many people kind of have this idea of little kids are worthless, right? <laughs> what value do they have? And Jesus says, this is valuable in the sight of God, right? Uh, it's natural for humanity all over the world to pick certain groups of humanity and say, that is not valuable. We can just dispense with that. We can get rid of that. We don't need that. Uh, but Christianity took looks at the poor and the weak and the oppressed and says, God cares about that person. Therefore, they have eternal value. Right? Uh, and so as, as Christians, we don't set ourselves above somebody else and say, well, I'm too good for that person. I'm better than that person. Right? As Christians, instead, we want to have the same mentality as God, uh, that Jesus was willing to bring himself down to our level to, to serve us, right? to condescend to our sinful humanity in order to bring us salvation. So in the same way, we want to be willing to associate with people of, of lower social status than us. We want to be able to uh, associate with people that are in, in any way that we perceive them as maybe lower than us. We want to have that humility that we serve them rather than uh, expecting other people to serve us. Uh, so the disciples learning some humility, that's going to continue on at verse 38. It says, Teacher, said it, John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. Quick pause here. Uh, there's some interesting uh, words here for us to consider uh, um, when we criticize off-brand Chris Christians, so to speak. Right? Um, as Christians, we want to be very careful uh, with, with how we criticize Christians of other church bodies and other denominations. In this case, uh, 
again, it's, it's valuable for us to call out false teaching. It's valuable for us to call out where those people are, are uh, teaching falsities in God's name. That's absolutely good. It's something we should be doing. Uh, but yeah, there, there is also a, a place for us to um, recognize that where, they, where the gospel does exist, God is working by his spirit. Um, and so we have to have that uh, understanding there. Again, the disciples have this pride of saying, we are the 12, right? We are the 12 disciples. We are the exclusive group. Uh, and so when somebody that is not one of us is teaching, he's got to stop, right? Because he's not one of us. Uh, and so Jesus says, no, that's not how it works in the kingdom of God, right? Uh, that's not how these things are to, to, uh, to work. All right, final section for us today. We're at verse 42. We're going to finish off this chapter here. And if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. If, you had, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. This is God's word. Um, so again, here Jesus is, is speaking very brutally about how we deal with sin. Uh, and it's, it's valuable for us to hear this. We naturally uh, dismiss our sins as being not that serious, not that important, right? Uh, I'm, I'm not killing anybody after all, so it's okay for me to do my little greediness uh, in this way or that way. Uh, that's naturally how we think. But Jesus says, no, uh, if, your, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, right? It's, it's far more important that you avoid sin at all costs. It's not good. It is evil. Why would we tolerate even the tiniest amount of evil in our lives? Um, now, Jesus is not saying that Christians ought to be mutilating themselves. Uh, the scriptures make it clear that uh, evil comes out of our hearts. And so if we really wanted to get rid of sin, we would have to tear our own hearts out. We would have to die, right? And this is, again, where we trust Jesus to take our sins away, not ourselves. But there is this very real reality that I should be uh, dealing with sin as severely as I need to, right? Uh, so if I find that uh, this group of friends is constantly leading me into some sin, maybe drinking too much or something, maybe I have to cut those sins out of my or those those friends out of my life uh, because they're leading me into sin. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, I, I can't uh, control my spending habits, right, with my credit card, and so I'm constantly uh, spending way more money than I should. Maybe I have to cut up that uh, that credit card and move to an only cash kind of a system. Um, maybe. Uh, Maybe uh, I, I'm constantly tempted to look up things that I shouldn't on my smartphone or something like that. Maybe I have to get a, a dumb phone instead, right? One that can't connect to the internet, can't show videos or whatever it is. Um, again, as Christians, we need to take our sins as seriously as possible. It's the way of the world to say other people have the really serious sins. They're the ones that need to take it seriously. I don't. Uh, Jesus says that's not how the kingdom of God works. Uh, we need to take our sins very seriously. Um, Jesus gives this picture of hell from Isaiah 66. It's this... Uh, um, place called Gehenna. It's this uh, dump that was outside of one of the cities. Uh, and there was this just like constant burning going on in this dump, uh, dump in this uh, dump heap. Uh, and there was, there was worms just everywhere that just seemed to always be there. Uh, and so that's the picture that Jesus gives there of hell, uh, of this just dumpster fire where these worms are just constantly eating through it. It's not a good place. We do not want to be there spiritually, right? And so Jesus says, take your sin as seriously as you need to. Um, and then he talks about saltiness. Uh, everyone will be salted with fire, so there's going to be trials in our lives. Um, and if we're not paying attention to our lives, if we're not living the way we ought, um, those trials are going to mess us up pretty bad, right? Uh, but if we are building properly in our lives, if we are doing the things we ought to be doing, we're going to be able to stand those tests. Uh, and then he warns about uh, losing your saltiness. Um, this is very interesting, too. Uh, you think about how, how would you make salt not salty? Um, and one way you might do that is throw your salt into a bunch of sand, right? Now, that salt is not good from anything, right? You don't want to put that kind of salt on your, <laughs> on your food or anything like that, right? Uh, salt uh, gets, gets ruined when it is mixed with the rest of the world. In the same way, our Christianity is going to get ruined if we mix it with the rest of the world. Uh, so if I start mixing uh, my Christianity with my politics or with my uh, dietary uh, or, or health uh, beliefs or, or whatever other part of my life, right? Um, if I'm mixing my Christianity with the ways of the world and saying that is what brings salvation, I'm going to ruin it, okay? Uh, our Christianity must remain pure. All right, that is everything for now. We went a little bit over today with that, though. God's richest blessings on you until we meet again. And